Welcome everyone to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson and I am the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome back to those of you who have joined us for previous programs. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of the trolley era and our collection that you can experience from the comfort of your home. We plan to continue these programs regularly. Uh, so if you do have a show that you'd like to share that fits our museum mission, please let me know. That'd be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, or cities where our streetcars come from. If you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway, and you can see the full list of upcoming presentations at our website, patrolley.org, which I can share in the chat box in just a couple minutes. And I want to extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated tonight when registering for this program and those who have made other donations this year through our website um, or for our capital campaign. We truly appreciate your support of our virtual outreach programs and of the museum. And I did mention this is our largest crowd ever tonight. In fact, some of you um, may have had trouble registering because we actually <coughs> sold out for this program last night. And one of our PTM members, Paul Grether, generously allowed us to use his Zoom account tonight, which allows up to 500 people um, compared to our usual 100. So we were, were able to reopen the registration. So thank you to Paul. And for those of you who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called uh, the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And the museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route that we're going to learn about tonight between Pittsburgh and Washington. You'll find about 50 trolleys and electric railway cars here, about 20 of which operate. About 30,000 people per year take the four-mile scenic ride here at the museum. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter, George Gula. Many of you may have seen him before. He grew up in both Pittsburgh, uh, oh no, he didn't grow up in Pittsburgh. He grew up in both oh. Philadelphia and Scranton, <laughs> developing his trolley interests at a young age in Philadelphia. And after graduating from Penn State with a degree in business logistics, he spent his entire career working in the transit business, first in Scranton and then in Pittsburgh, where he worked from 1975 until his retirement in 2018. He joined the museum in 1975 and currently serves as an operator and a conductor at the museum. He volunteers in the archives and he gives lots of outreach programs like this one. And he'll be doing some in person next month as well. So thank you again, George. He's been writing for Trolley Fair, the member newsletter since 1977. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenter, but the chat box will be open throughout the show. So feel free to enter questions there or answer other people's questions there. Um, I will pop in if there are any comments that pop up. Um, that you know relate to a particular slide or we can read through those at the end and just to note this program again is being recorded will be available on our youtube um, within the next couple weeks so you'll notice that your microphones are muted we'll go ahead and turn our videos off as well just so that they don't cover up any portion um, of the screen or um, interfere with bandwidth or anything like that um, I'll invite everybody to turn those back on at the end as well. So please don't be offended if I come along and turn your video off. You will also notice that George has text on a lot of his slides. Um, sometimes when the Zoom chat pops up at the bottom, it can cover up some of that text. Don't worry too much about it because George is going to talk about it. Um, so you don't have to worry about reading the text on the slide. So, all right, George, without further ado, uh, why don't you take it away? Well, let's see if uh, if it works as well as the test. Always got to wonder about that. <clears throat> Looks okay. good here. Can you see me? I see your slides. Yep. Okay. Well, and uh, <laughs> this this has been a long time in coming. Hi, glad everybody's here. I might be a little afraid that that many people are here, but um, we we are on the right of way, as we said, and uh, a lot of people have wanted to see something about the uh, Washington line. And uh, of course, we also have to give credit to, in this case, an awful lot of people and probably missed a few here. And if I did and uh, you just happen to see a picture um, pop up, let me know. 
um, because I don't want to mess you guys up. Um, I like to start at the very beginning, and we will be starting at the very beginning. Uh, for those of you, and it sounds like a lot of you are not from around here, I've got two maps up. And the one on the left uh, really shows a lot of the electric uh, railway activity in Allegheny County. Um, you'll see lines going north. Uh, that's the Harmony route um, going out of there. And, and a lot of the dark black lines are Pittsburgh Railways. Over on the right uh, is the West Penn Railways, which operated south of uh, south and uh, east of uh, Pittsburgh and through the Coke region. So a lot of that. And the red arrows are showing you what we're really going to be talking about, that interurban line that uh, if any of you were with me a couple of months ago, we talked about Charleroi. Uh, this is going to run out the Char Charleroi line, and then uh, we'll cut off on its own. Now, we got to start out in the beginning, and I'm starting out in Washington when the electric railway first uh, showed up. That was the Washington uh, Electric Street Railway, uh, and it was chartered in 1889, um, began construction in November of 1890, uh, began operation on May 9th of 1891, and uh, it ran to 1893 or so. Um, you can see what the original uh, line line was. The uh, orange is that. Can't get my mouse to work, so I am sorry about that. Uh, but the orange line up on the top was uh, Wilshire, Wilson's Orchard and down Locust Street, uh, right through town and all the way down Main Street to the uh, Washington and Waynesburg Railroad Depot. Then this was uh, opening day. It was a three mile line. Um, it opened uh, April 24th. There was a car running first uh, through the business district. Ahead of that, they had run some cars with nobody on it. But uh, there was May 9th, 1891. And uh, they had four cars, uh, two of which were used immediately. And uh, the third was placed in service uh, in July, July 4th. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I don't know where I got this, but it's kind of neat. Oh, Jim Heron. Jim Heron uh, let me use quite a bit of his stuff. Uh, it was not a successful line, small line, low ridership, and uh, the receipts that were collected couldn't even pay uh, for the contractor's construction costs. This is uh, Main Street in Washington. Um, typical equipment that was used back then, and that line became insolvent on June 30th of 1893, Put the company into receivership. The receiver continued to operate until around December 12th. Uh, and making so little money, he was forced to uh, end the service. Now, the new interest bought the line the following year, early in the following year. Um, you see that little blue line uh, in the uh, center low part of the map. Uh, that was a line that had gone to Bellevue. The Bellevue section never developed, um, and they pulled up some of the track, and they took uh, the east-west line, that uh, line running at a 45-degree angle, um, down as far as McCarroll Avenue on Chestnut Street. Um, <clears throat> they also built a line out Jefferson Avenue, and uh, they had to build a second car house, the original one down by the B&O Railroad Bridge um, on Maiden Street, got too small. They had increased the size of their fleet. Uh, so they built the new car house, went out Jefferson Avenue, and even went into the new Woodland Park uh, that was put in there. They also ran the Maiden Street line out to Dunn Avenue. And there is a shot of the second car house. And you can see some of the typical equipment out there. <clears throat> now, you, you all heard of the Washington and Cannonsburg Street Railway. That had a somewhat complicated beginning uh, with the Cannonsburg Street Railway being chartered on July 6th, 1898, and then merging in 1902 with the Washington property that was already running the cars um, and becoming the Washington and Cannonsburg Railway Company, um, whose name obviously announced the intentions of this new operation. Um, they were going to build the eight miles or so to Cannonsburg. Um, and they actually began the grading in 1902 and began track laying in 1903. Um, Cannonsburg's up in the uh, left uh, left upper corner, and you can see the Washington track. And that's when it's all finished um, over on the right 
So, you know, they they did this. There's the extension they built 0.4 miles to what would become the third car barn in Washington. And that's the Tylerdale barn that we all know and love. Uh, McCarroll Avenue down on Chestnut Street. Uh, the line got extended a bit farther down from there. And if you notice in 192 uh, on Maiden Street, so over on your right, they made an extension past Dunn Avenue. Dunn Avenue is the road that, that would go up into Washington Park. <clears throat> there is a shot of the car barn at Tylerdale. That would become Pittsburgh Railway's property uh, very soon. And that barn would be used until the end of service. Here's some shots along the line. We're in Cannonsburg and we'll kind of roll down to Washington so you can see what really was the very beginning of our interurban. Uh, September of 1903 here, and you can see some of the equipment uh, on a nice snowy day. <clears throat> These were some beautiful cars, uh, 200 to 204 and uh, everybody's posing for a picture. This is what would run uh, even under Pittsburgh Railway's auspices for a while. That's Cannonsburg, the upper part of Cannonsburg, I believe, on Pike Street. And the cars rolled pretty much all the way down from the northern part of Cannonsburg. Um, and at the southern part of Cannonsburg, when Pike Street still veers off, as it does, that's a toll booth over there, um, the line cut off on its own, went pretty straight through this uh, desolated area. Uh, it had two bridges at crossed uh, Chartier's Creek. <clears throat> and uh, you can, that's a nice, nobody had a drone back then, so I don't know what the guy did to get a shot, but you're looking north on Pike Street. And uh, there's that first bridge. It had a steel plate girder section in the middle. Uh, the rest of it was wood. Um, and there was uh, an open car, one of the several owned by the Washington and Cannonsburg. And that's the same location. It's crossing underneath uh, the plate girder bridge. <clears throat> and then you had a siding out here. Uh, Bamfield siding, I think, was out in here. Um, give you an idea of how desolate some of the country was, mostly agrarian. Uh, back then, certainly not built up. <clears throat> You're in Cannonsburg, or I'm sorry, downtown Houston, and, and the car is uh, turning uh, off Pike Street, and it's going to make sort of a, a right and a left-hand turn to rise up on a pretty steep trestle. It needed to cross the Pennsylvania Railroad there, and there it is. Those of you that had kids, at least uh, I don't know right now, but in the old days, the Houston Pumpkin Festival was here. Senior citizen location on the other side now. Um, they had uh, 13 bridges on this line between Washington and Cannonsburg. Obviously, the biggest one being the Banfield trestle over a thousand feet long. Um, everybody should know where this is if you operate streetcars. Um, there's the Pennsylvania Railroad over on the right. We're looking north along the Washington and Cannonsburg um, toward what would be now Museum Road um, and the county home. Uh, the Mining Railroad uh, was owned, owned by and built by the Meadowlands Coal Company. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad was very happy to take the coal and haul it, but they knew uh, that mining extraction was limited. It was gonna go away. So they did not want to invest. Um, and this is sort of interesting because, of course, our right of way is not only on the Washington and Cannonsburg, but it is on part of the Meadowlands Coal Company right away. And if you went just through our car barn, our present car barn, you would cross, I think that's Chartier's Creek again. And as you come up to Main Street, here's one of the 200 series cars um, approaching Main Street. Yeah, Pennsylvania Railroad still on the right. Those bridge abutments are still today there. And uh, eventually you'd wander across the creek a couple of times again. Um, and there is the car barn. And uh, I believe we're looking south. Uh, that's the 192 barn that would continue to operate um, until the last cars ran and in, uh, in, uh, the local cars ran in 1953. And we'll get to that. Um, you can see this location today. It's not nearly that wide. Uh, the bridge is a different bridge and it spans more of the eroded gap that the railroad occupied. And over um, on, the, on the right is the Bronson House, Bronson House, which is still there for the building. <clears throat> 
is still there. And you'll get to downtown uh, in Washington where the company did have offices. One of the 200 cars there. Now, what happens is it's a nice little, little compact railway and it's serving the locals and north of Cannonsburg in Allegheny County, you know, and uh, other parts of Washington County events were going on. And we had talked about this. For those of you who had a chance to watch the Charleroi show, the Mellons uh, got an interest in building a line from uh, Monongahela north up to Pittsburgh. And they did that. And uh, they also uh, strengthened the existing line south of Monongahela through Charleroi, um, eventually down to Allenport and Roscoe. So you can see that map of uh, which was actually stolen from my show. If you guys can see it, don't complain. Uh, these were 3,500 series cars and they were heavy and Pittsburgh railways usually use them on some pretty long lines. Uh, well, that's what opened the service on the Charleroi line in October 10th, 1903. Um, and from the Charleroi line, uh, at this point, they had to go to Castle Shannon and up through Mount Lebanon and down uh, West Liberty Avenue to what would be the Liberty Tunnels and then sort of take a right and a left or a left and a right uh, and head up the hill to an incline to take people in. And I say that because initially this is what uh, riders on the Washington line would also have to do. And of course, 1904. Uh, if Elizabeth's on, no, I haven't found any digging pictures inside the tunnel, uh, but it opened in December of 1904, and also the route, what would become 42, and maybe most of you know it is 4238 through Dormont and Beachview, that would open too, and that would allow the, 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 wash, the trolleys um, on the Charlotte Rail Line to uh, eliminate all the traffic um, on West Liberty Avenue. Uh, a map, you know, and the mid Pittsburgh Railways purchased uh, the line. Actually, Philadelphia Company did that with Pittsburgh Railways becoming the operator. And I'm not sure if I put the map in the right place, but we'll talk about it anyway. Uh, it bought it for $1,125,000, uh, which was a tremendous amount of money in 1906. And they would start to improve things right away. The orange um, is um, the existing track. And uh, the red, they'd start to build the red here, or the green rather, at North Washington, uh, which had gone out to the, uh, the Wilson, uh, I'm going to read that, Wilson Avenue. That was extended out to the Borough Line. Um, Maiden Street had already been built out there. That would be extended up to the Washington Park. They built the, uh, the Bow Street Line out to East Washington. Um, yeah, I put this in the wrong place. And I'm sorry, I was rushing in the end. They also extended the, the line down from McCarroll Avenue. Um, I suspect I probably put these in the wrong place. Um, that last little extension on the bottom took three years because um, even though it was only 2,600 feet, it involved condemnation proceedings. So this, this is the Washington line um, in its final state. The Washington local cars would operate on three separate lines here. Um, it's Pittsburgh Railways, its own equipment. I have several versions of this show. I'm hoping I, I have the right one up, but this is what Pittsburgh Railways did. Um, they sent some of their own cars down. Um, and there's some shots here, mostly at the end of the Jefferson Maiden line. Jefferson Maiden was a very, very, very heavy line. Ah, now the Washington line would consist of actually two underlying companies. Um, the first one is Washington and Cannonsburg uh, company. And uh, I won't go through the financial machinations there, but uh, that was already existing. Here um, is how Pittsburgh Railways made the connection from the existing Charlotte Rail line down to Cannonsburg. They chartered three uh, separate paper companies. Uh, they were only there to um, purchase land, um, secure franchises, and uh, they, the lines began construction on May 31st, 1906. These lines would eventually be joined together uh, with the Washington and Cannonsburg, uh, and it would become the uh, Pittsburgh 
uh, um, excuse me, they leased it to the Washington and Cannesburg. Um, then Pittsburgh Railways would control um, this whole mess. Um, there is the line that opened February 15th, 1909. Um, it's still going to run through Mount Lebanon and into Dormont and down to the tunnel. Um, they won't be able to get get it running through the tunnel until later. Uh, here is some of the original equipment that ran the 3500s. They also used those 200 to 204 cars. Uh, or, and uh, that's Morganza. I know it's somewhat of a blurred shot, but it, you know, certainly different from what it looks like now. Now, here's the new line, the new cars that were purchased. And uh, these were the 3600s. And I think there were 20 of them and they were very, very plush inside uh, for cars at that period of time. And then these other cars would later show up uh, 37 to 3714 were built by Brill. Um, and later 3800 to 3814, uh, that came in, in uh, from St. Louis. And that came in in 1928. And the reason it did was they had bought 3750 to 3769 uh, for service on Washington and Trelleray. And they were yellow cars. And um, I guess they had typical yellow car trucks and they were pretty bouncy on this open track. They really did not provide a good ride. Uh, and so they eventually would cut uh, doors on the uh, left side of some of them, and they would use them on the Swickley lines. And some of them would stay around to run on the, uh, uh, they would run on the uh, line to uh, Shannon. And uh, they had their problems, of course. George, we got a request to slow down just a little bit on some of them. Oh, I can do that. Certainly. You want to see that again? I, I've got to know that. I can't see anybody here. Um, and uh, now I don't know anything about this accident before uh, somebody asks, but it's on the Washington line and they took a pull up. <laughs> they got off the track somehow. Uh, they were able to start freight service in 1907. And we spoke on the Charlery uh, service. And I think some of this was taken from that uh, because not only did Charlery get freight service, but Washington did too. They had freight stations in Cannonsburg and in Washington. Um, and the legislature over the objections of the railroads um, allowed trolleys to carry freight. And these were typical cars. Um, in fact, one of the what would be 200 series Washington and Cannonsburg cars would eventually become a freight car. It was still around in the 1960s. So this is Grant Street, uh, roughly where the Boulevard of the Allies uh, comes in today into town. There's the B&O station in the background and uh, that big shed it, it would disappear uh, with the construction of the parkway. And the original uh, freight operation was on the street. Now, there is the milk cans and they carried ice cream and furniture and appliances. I mean, all sorts of stuff was carried here. And having this terminal on the street created quite a scheduling problem for the, the other trolleys running up and down on Grand Street. And the horses probably complicated things in the wagons. What they eventually did would, would and I don't have a shot of that, there were the old exhibition buildings down along the Allegheny River near the point. And in better days, they had conventions there. And it was a big cavernous building. Uh, they would move the freight terminal there. There was two tracks on the outside of the in, inside the building, but on the outer ends. And in the center of the building, wagons and later trucks could go in. <clears throat> and that was used not only by uh, Pittsburgh Railways, but by West Penn cars and also by cars coming off the Harmony line. And that would all disappear. This would all disappear uh, in 1941. That building in the back, the big brick building, is the still extant uh, substation that was built in Cannonsburg. And the, the track went along the side of the building and the freight station was just south of the building, just south of the track. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, being loaded and unloaded. <clears throat> including Reich's High School. And so 
they 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 were still making money in 1941, but when the city told them they had to move their terminal, they weren't making that much money. Um, and at that point, Pittsburgh Railways uh, and West Penn got out of the freight business. Now, they had a, a trucking service. And uh, so you could do some door to door. Um, and instead of taking your wagon over to the freight station, you would be able to have this trolley transfer service, um, drop off stuff at your business, including the ice cream, as you can see. Um, I don't know if I'd want to be the guy walking on this plank um, with that hand truck. But if your business wasn't at the freight station, this was one way to do it. Um, and I'm sure this was done more than once. And many times out in the country, too, people, farmers um, would just pull up their wagons to, to get what they needed at a road crossing, which may not have necessarily been a trolley stop. Here's the line looking um, south, and we're near St. Anne's uh, stop. Um, Willow Avenue would be down here eventually. It's not here now. And uh, this view shows the signals that were installed by Union Switch and Signal in 1928. Um, they're just like the uh, signals at the museum. They're absolute permissive block signals. Um, they have the head blocks at the sightings. They have intermediate signals because so much of the Washington line was single track. Um, this wasn't necessarily installed because there was a nasty accident that precluded it, but they did want to replace Nashod's uh, with a more reliable system. And this involved track circuits, just like at the trolley museum. Well, we're going to take a ride, and uh, we're going to take a ride by coming inbound. We're entering the Smithfield Street Bridge. Uh, there is the shelter by the PNLE station, uh, which had a big clock on it which I think has survived. It is up in a uh, retirement home in Sewickley. I remember seeing that, giving a program there years ago. And uh, we're at the south end of the bridge, about 1938. Uh, the interurban would serve all three of Pittsburgh's major railway stations. In addition to the PNLE, it would serve that b &O station um, at the other end of the Smithfield Street Bridge, the north end. And then it would uh, walk, walk itself up Grant Street to the intersection with Liberty. And so this is one of the 3,700 uh, cars that lasted until about 1949. And it would make that tight turn. And now we've passed the Pennsylvania Railroad Station, which is in the background, uh, now being used as luxury apartments. It's during the war, 1944. So somebody snapped a picture and that may, be, may have been illegal unless he had permission. And uh, the car now becomes an outbound car. So now we're coming down in the proper direction. This is 4th Avenue on Wood Street. And uh, that track uh, here uh, was short turn trackage that was used by Port Authority right up until the end of trolley service um, downtown about 1984 so. Yeah, nice old automobiles. Uh, we're going to turn onto what was then Water Street, and today it is known as Fort Pitt Boulevard. You can almost hear that squeal. Um, and I use this from the Charlotte Ray Show. It's an Allegheny County photo, but it shows two interurbans, uh, both Washington and Charlotte Ray cars left together on the hour and a half hour. And uh, they would not pick up anybody or drop, or they would drop off on the outbound pickup, um, perhaps on the inbound. But uh, a lot of local service was provided by Shannon cars. There, there it is at the PNLE. You get a big idea of what it looks like. That is Station Square today. I have no idea what the color of the Mon River is back then, but it's before 1949, or the old interurbans wouldn't be running. And then the 3,500 foot trolley tunnel. Um, we got to go through that to South Hills Junction. There's the derail switch. So you had to stop and activate that derail switch before you went down into that steep grade. Um, these cars, these 1,600 cars that received new Clark uh, B2 A trucks, um, he's at South Hills. 
and uh, nobody here is well dressed. They're all going somewhere. They don't care about the trucks. Uh, but these were experimental, uh, better springing, among other things. And a lot of the stuff they did to these trucks would be built into the 1700 series in 1949. 1700 to 1724. And that is the old South Hills uh, Junction building. Uh, the corner <clears throat> below that left corner had the dispatcher's uh, office up above was crew quarters, uh, break room and all the dispatcher was in uh, there also. And there was a large room to act as an interurban station. And here we are leaving uh, South Hills Junction and tunnel yard is off to the left uh, beginning where the uh, freight car is, there's the uh, high school, South Hills High School on top. And this, this totally looks different. There's a lot of concrete here today. Um, and then they will use that right away. You can still, you can see it over on the, uh, the right side of the right upper side of the photo. It's crossing the Liberty Tunnels. It was the old Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon Railroad right of way. Uh, that Pittsburgh Railways leased uh, from the railroad and eventually they would <laughs> lease it from uh, what would be Consul Coal. And they finally got rid of that lease about 1950. And uh, the railroad stayed in effect, in other words, as a paper company for the purposes of collecting the rent um, after their services ended. And we're out on this right away that was up on the hillside above Route 51. And the uh, the guardrail, our original narrow gauge guardrail, and they always placed them that far from the rails. And that's because that's what the old specs were. When the Charlotte Rail Line came through and they ran their trolleys up here at, at, by day and the railroad ran at night, um, this is what it was like, dual gauge. And uh, this car is passing what is currently Denise Stop. Uh, this was known as Smith. Um, and I put it in there because that's one of the 3700s, which will operate as far as Shannon. Although occasionally these cars ran Cannonsburg trippers. Now, now there, <laughs> if anybody drives Route 51, how'd you like to drive this? This was what would be Route 51 uh, before the county got involved in construction. We're looking north and that, uh, that trestle is what spanned Route 51. And if you really wanted to get under it, you took the road on the right and behind the house. And, you know, there was a little, a little uh, space that you could drive through. And it was replaced by this. So this is Route 51 as they built it in the late 20s and early 30s. It's not the four lane uh, mess it is today, but, and not much traffic down there either. But this bridge would last until uh, all of the PCC cars were gone and they began rebuilding this uh, part of the system as a light rail line. And we're looking north across that bridge. Here's where Mellon's double track began um, all the way down. This is, this is where that beautiful, reasonably straight right of way um, existed. And uh, we'll see a couple shots. There's, I believe, Hamlet School back there. Um, and it ran between along Route 88, eventually 51, and then Route 88, um, highways here, down to Castle Shannon and through Castle Shannon into Bethel Park, where it would cut off on its own line. Now we're looking inbound. There's Hamilton School, Grove Road um, is down there. And Castle Shannon um, downtown and the Pittsburgh and West Virginia trestle, the railroad trestle, is behind it. This is 1942 during the war and the track is in very good shape. And uh, behind me, they're not behind me, but behind the trolley is Frederick Street, Glenberry stop. Um, it's where the current busway ends. And this is the trolley line, of course, was all private right away. And uh, it, is, it is heading down towards Castle Shannon now. And it's Castle Shannon. I believe I used this one, but it's a great shot. It's 3,700. It shows the railroad. Um, and of course, it, except for the new cars, it's fairly similar today. And the car is southbound. Uh, this is now, I believe, the blue line. And uh, I left this one in from the Charlotte Ray show. Um, it's a Washington car, but it shows the switches for 
the loop around the former administration building. This was a car house at one time. And the ad building was over on my um, left. And there would be a loop around the building. And this is where the Shannon car is. And they picked up all the local service uh, passengers in through here. Now, Washington. And there's, the, in fact, the car house, which if it looks like a steam railroad shop, it is. Uh, this is where the steam locomotives were serviced um, by Pittsburgh Railways. And this is where the inner urban division would be based until about 1932. And then they would bring it up the tunnel car house. And the men that worked the inner urban um, had their own seniority system. It was two different seniority systems for local cars um, and for inner urbans. And then right down the road is um, this location. We're crossing Willow Avenue at what was known as Martin Villa. We'll do an S turn and um, we're not very far. We're about a mile now from the beginning of the Washington line. Um, this was the late thirties. And uh, you could see in the late thirties, there weren't a whole lot of people living out here. This is South of downtown Castle Shannon. And even by the late thirties, uh, Pittsburgh railways continued to have reorganization plans brought out. Um, and always included was the abandonment of the interurban service on both Charleroi and Washington. But the problem was every time a plan came out, there was somebody that didn't like it and they would have to go back and do it again until the war came. And of course, once the war came, people were very happy uh, at Pittsburgh Railways because all of a sudden the, the traffic was up. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have somewhat have a feeling that I, I put on a different show. I have a few, and I'll know very soon. Here's Washington Junction. Um, I had a working copy and then I had another working copy and uh, uh, you get confused sometimes. Uh, but if I ask Kristen to just change it, we can change it quickly if we could. Here's the Washington cars coming off on their double track and then immediately they're going to go into their single track. And uh, uh, it would be like this, except for passing sightings and some double track in Cannonsburg all the way down to Washington. Um, here's looking uh, towards Washington Junction in the background, those high hills uh, from Highland Road. This was the Garvey stop. And uh, we're now on typical Bethel Park right of way. And today, of course, if I looked off Highland Road, there, there's a house just about everywhere. There's houses on top of houses. Um, the dump back there is coal uh, slag. We would call it calm up in Scranton, but it was the same. It was all the ditches that came out of the mine once they uh, were able to separate it from the coal. There's Highland Road again. Some housing, but not nearly um, as much. Now, let me know if I go too fast. I, I never know. Here's uh, one of the sightings with the signals. This was a union switch and signal. Um, photo um, and the car is inbound. It's on Brookside siding. Uh, even in Port Authority days, there was a Brookside siding uh, protected by these um, signals. It was about two cars long. Periodically, the Port Authority would car get cars all locked up in these sightings, and I don't know how. The, the number is 107. Uh, and as you head south out of Washington Junction, uh, the numbers are in the 100s. They start at the 100s. So uh, now they didn't have these signals um, in Cannesburg because of the street traffic. They used nayshots in Cannesburg uh, and there will be nayshots in Washington as well. So there were, there were gaps in the light. Uh, Arnold, I think is where they pick it up again beyond Cannesburg. Here is, uh, you wouldn't recognize this today. There's a McDonald's here and a whole bunch of other stuff and the track goes underneath. This is Fort Couch Road in Bethlehem Park. Um, probably in the, uh, uh, I don't know what that car is, but somebody can type it in. Probably in the 50s, though, my guess, or early 60s, because the development that exists there now still wasn't there. Drake Trestle, huge, 470 foot long. Uh, there is the shelter um, over on the right. Uh, that was in somebody's backyard until the 80s. Uh, it used as a shed. The car is southbound. We're crossing or going to cross McLaughlin Run Road. There's Bethel Park Road. Um, coming down from the right, and it was an expensive bridge, $12,740 um, to build this structure. 
and then we'll start. There's a few sightings before you get down to Route 19. This was one of them. This was Cremona. Uh, you can't find this today. It's not there. Um, although a uh, former archivist at Leibarger uh, knows how to follow the pole lines and uh, he can show me, but you would not recognize this area today. And uh, Cremona had a passing track and of course a sighting. And so everybody, you know, tried to get pictures of two cars and, you know, it usually was pretty easy to do. That's the typical Pittsburgh Railways shelter uh, sitting there behind a pole. And uh, now we'll head down a few stops. And I've never found this on the stop list, uh, but I was able to identify it from other sources as Hayes Road near Lindenwood. <clears throat> so you're in the area of Boyce Road. And Paris Lake was a stop. Um, so I gather it was a later day stop. And what is Paris Lake? Um, some, some people used to look at this and go, oh, Paris Lake. And of course, I didn't grow up here, but Paris Lake, um, as it was told to me, uh, was kind of a mud hole type of affair, but it was a business. The owner of the property um, rented out the lake for swimming in the summer and ice skating in the winter. <clears throat> and this very opulent shelter was built for people um, who you had to walk a little bit to the water. Um, but it was a place to uh, recreate uh, down in this area. We're in Washington County now. I think we've just passed um, the boundary. And here is one more shot. They let you know it's Paris Lake and they kind of, I don't think, yeah, they tell you where it is. So you, it's going to the right. Get off the trolley and, and go right. It's not the there comments, today. Uh, from Bruce, he says uh, Paris Lake is actually in Allegheny County. Oh, it is. Well, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. That's Bruce Wells, right? Yep. Okay, well, I will make a note of that. Thank you. All right, but we are getting down to uh, the other county. Here's county line. And uh, there's signal 119, another union switch and signal photo. This one we don't have. This one is in the, uh, probably it's, it's in the possession of the Carnegie, which uh, allowed me to use it. And most of these photos were taken when the signals were new, which is why I'm guessing it's probably a 1928 photograph. And I found a color uh, photograph. I was looking through slides and lo and behold, we got uh, two cars passing in color and you can see the uh, permissive block signals installed. I think cars almost always pass the county line. There's always pictures of two cars um, at county line. Uh, that road over on the left, I believe, is Route 19. This uh, was old county line. Though, the, the road that crossed it was old Washington Road, which before 19 was put in um, as a major highway, sort of wiggled around first to the right and then to the left and then to the right of the existing highway. And um, it was a little two lane affair, typical shelter over here. Um, another shot that's similar, but I wanted to show the road. Um, and that shows the crossing, uh, you know, so um, obviously they expected people to be prepared to stop. For those of us that like to cross Main Street, there are no electric signals here. And this is Old Washington Road and we're looking south, car coming in north and uh, it's rather unpaved road. So how'd you like to drive from Pittsburgh to Washington over that? Um, stone rock, probably some holes in there somewhere. And notice that this, this area, which is now full of homes, um, is still very, very agrarian. And probably my last shot here, uh, looking down, shows the crossing, uh, shows the newer highway, which I believe was put in in 1941. And uh, you, you can go on Old Washington Road today, but you can't actually tell the difference. It's very, very, very developed here. It would run uh, parallel to, close to um, the highway. And we're just north of Donaldson's Crossroads a bit. And uh, that is the next structure to be encountered. And that is the Valley Brook Road Trust. Yeah. I think I have the older show up because uh, there should be another picture in here instead. Um, so let's, I, and I really, really should put the other one up. Um, it's an expensive bridge, as you can see, the super, superstructures 
uh, very expensive. And then they had to pay almost $5,000 for the excavation. Uh, oh, no, it's the right one. I'm sorry. Here's a better shot of the bridge. And I thought I had this in front, which is why I, I was almost startled. Um, there's three lanes. It would eventually become four on Route 19. Here's a much better shot of the bridge. And uh, this is 1948. Ed Miller, I believe, was out here. And we do have a number of his photos. Uh, Ed was an excellent photographer. So instead of just getting a shot of the bridge, um, he's got a northbound car. Uh, coming up. Um, the road down along the highway there, the intersection is Valley Brook Road, which went under this bridge. And the Montour Railroad also went under this bridge. So I have a feeling this is a fan trip, but. Uh, Ralph notes that the power line tower was still there a few years ago until they rebuilt the intersection. Oh, really? That's yeah, I remember the when they rebuilt there. the intersection. Yeah. And just north of Thompsonville Trestle was a Pittsburgh Railway substation. And the building is still there uh, serving another use. And it still says Pittsburgh Railways on it. And of course, on a long, like, long line like this, you would definitely need a substation. I don't know if somebody got a drone. I don't think they existed here in what I gather is the early 50s, somewhere before 1953. But uh, it's another great shot of the uh, of the line. We're we're looking north, so the substation is behind those trees uh, on the left of the track. Now, um, just down from there, I threw this in just to, just because I thought it was great. It wasn't a track shot like everybody takes. That's the stage. That's the stop. If you lived out here at or stop, you would just wander up on the probably lousy walks and muddy roads uh, if need be to get to the inner urban. And this is what you would wait, wait in this wonderful shelter. And very similar um, to Ridgefold, but I suspect Ridgefold is in much better shape uh, than that. It does look painted. And uh, we're gonna, you know, start down. Um, we're gonna start down circling around to get to Cheeseman. So we're south of Ork. And the track would pull away from the road a bit and just circle around and then uh, get be able to go underneath uh, Route 19 uh, at Cheeseman. Cheeseman's stop was named for the owners of the property, or at least the one-time owners of the property. That was the Cheeseman Farm. And uh, these pictures were taken off of uh, um, Route 19. And this is a southbound car uh, getting ready to go under, under the highway. Um, Ed Leibarger, our former archivist who, who lived down there, said that the farm was split um, in 1941 when the highway uh, came through. So here's a northbound car. Uh, the barn was always a great backdrop. And uh, we have passed under Route 19. There's more of the Cheeseman uh, property. Uh, looks like a nice late day shot. And... Uh, Although looking at it, I'm wondering if that's a morning shot now, but uh, it could be west, it could be north. Um, but I think he is moving southbound, no question. And uh, looking off 19 in that direction, that's the Cheeseman stop. And a lot of these stops I know Van Emmett had uh, in order to get the uh, track across the property, uh, you made different agreements, but it was almost always that we were gonna give you a stop and provide a shelter. Um, and there's a 3,700 southbound um, getting ready, I think, to pick somebody up. It looks like he's gonna pick somebody up. These, these older cars were, were scrapped very quickly after the uh, 1700 series PCC cars arrived. My understanding was these were really in bad shape. The war um, had not helped their condition. Somebody had told me once they ride in the back and you can see the front of the car moving uh, in a different direction. Uh, Ed Leibarker, who had become a long time, still is a museum member, a long time archivist, was about 10 years old. Um, and the service was almost over, I believe, August of 53, uh, when his father uh, took a picture of him here at Cheeseman. And I just had to throw it in. And of course, it has all the typical backdrops, the wooden bridge, uh, the signal, and the uh, shelter, which le looks like it's leaning a little bit. Go down a little ways, 
cross McMurray Road. And uh, I believe there's a nursing home here right now. Uh, the line is going to go pretty much straight down to Van Eam and then curve a little bit. Um, and we'll come in along McMurray Road farther, farther down. Here is the huge trestle, another trestle, a third trestle at Van Eam. And uh, this is July of 52. So just a little bit, you know, we, we have another year and almost, almost two years to go. Um, 587 feet long. It spanned a very wide hollow and a very small creek. And then right below that, you know, you're going to get to Van Emmon sighting um, with the typical signals put in here. This was March of 1944. Um, notice how desolately uh, uh, abandoned everything looks. It's, it's all farmland. There were very few riders uh, here. And uh, there's the shelter for Mr. Van Emmon. He, uh, there's a, an article uh, which I don't need to post, which is here in the Washington papers. And it said, well, you know, I have my stop and they built this gentleman a tunnel uh, under the track so he could get his cattle between one side and another. And uh, uh, when the interurban was abandoned in August of 1953, he was still getting on his shelter every day and uh, would go to work at a hardware store in Cannesburg. Um, we think this is Morganza Road. It's a very early shot. That's 3,600, obviously. And uh, they certainly didn't, didn't capture it as well as, you know, we might with better cameras now. But that's a very typical road. And uh, for that period, that early period, and uh, I like to show this to uh, people um, when we do an in-person program because they're pretty startled to realize just you know, them driving over interstate highways and then realizing, well, <laughs> I got to take a wagon over this to go to Cannonsburg. But uh, we've come down McMurray Road. Now we are along Morganza Road, and this is a Union switch and signal photograph. And at 139, uh, and I believe that arch bridge is still there. Uh, there was a railroad crossing up over there too. And I believe you can see their, their truss bridge uh, between the poles. But we're heading south. Um, and we'll parallel this. This right of way was here until they widened and rebuilt um, Morganza Road. Here is R3756. Um, it's a great shot of the right of way along Morganza Road. It was single track. Um, it's on its way down to the museum, its new home on February 7th, 1954. And there are two other cars uh, with him. This, I think, is the last one in the parade. Here's 832. Um, which I had a chance to train on, a wonderful car. Uh, they did a wonderful job at the museum doing this. And it will cross Morganza Road here um, on the way down to Richville Trestle. And notice over on the right, there's another track. Um, they were very optimistic and decided to put that track in just in case uh, they double tracked it. And then they wouldn't have to tear the road up. Uh, Pittsburgh Railways took a lot of things into an account, in account when they did um, their work. And we will head south. We're now crossing the fields between uh, Morganza Road and Richfield, Richfield, and uh, 3,800 coming down. When I first got to Pittsburgh, all I ever saw were 3,700s on the Washington line. But uh, a lot of pictures that I've discovered since, you know, leads me to believe that 37s and 38s equally shared um, this right away. We're on. The Richfield Trestle. It is a very early photograph. It's a 3600. Looks like a school group um, of some kind, all pretty natally dressed for that period, of course. Um, there was a walkway on this bridge. It was a big bridge. Um, it was 719 feet long. And it curved um, and crossed the Pennsylvania Railroad and then to enter Cannonsburg at Adams Avenue. And roughly over on the left at the end of the bridge is where uh, the Washington and Cannonsburg uh, was at the connection, this, this railway, uh, Pittsburgh, Washington and Cannonsburg, uh, the paper company would, would, that's how it would connect. And uh, another shot of that, um, but it's a nice wide shot. So it really gives you an idea of the area. Um, I suspect it was from ectochrome film. That's what it looks like. But there's Ridgefold Shelter. Um, all of our guests get on today at the Trolley Museum at Ridgefold Shelter. And there it is.
We have a couple shots here. Here's the motorman's view coming in. Cannonsburg. And it will enter on Adams, Adams Avenue, as I said. Adams will eventually turn into Pike, Pike Street. 1709 coming north. There's a the shelter. Um, that was a double track uh, siding along that area behind the shelter. And as you can see, and today you can still park on that right away, particularly if you want an ice cream at Sarah's. Um, this was May 28th, 1949. And, uh, and there's another shot. So we have, we're meeting, we're having a passing. And I'm wondering if gentlemen are out there because there is a fan trip um, going on here. But that shows both the bridge and the shelter. Kind of nice. And one more shot, maybe. And so hurdles down the line. Okay, we're looking inbound now and the sighting will end down there. That is Adams Avenue. Um, the railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad's off to the left in the trees. And of course, down below, this was 1948, one of the 1600s that had the special trucks. And that's at the same location, different angle. Now we'll come down a little ways. We're actually all roughly opposite the substation in Cannesburg. And I believe we're still along Adams Avenue. And that uh, 3600 was involved in an accident with an automobile. And I believe if I read that report right, there was a fatality. Uh, that is the Pennsylvania Railroad. We are uh, looking south then. Um, and uh, this is 1916, June 6, 1916. And they took several accident photos. And both Jim Heron and I saw a number of them on eBay and were bidding against each other. And uh, he got some and I got some. And so we, we agreed to exchange scans. I believe they're now property of the museum. Um, there, in fact, is the track leading into the substation and the freight house. We're looking north um, and you get an idea of what the right of way uh, looked like. And uh, it was double track here. There's a nice shot of the car, which is why I included that. And the accident occurred here at the uh, um, at the crossing. Very nice picture of the car, though. Um, there is our substation, and uh, um, this part of the line got their power from West Bend Power. Um, Allegheny County, of course, purchased uh, all their power uh, from Duquesne Light, and that included Pittsburgh Railways. And there was a strike in 1946, last several weeks, um, in which a lot of the trolleys were not running. Uh, but Pittsburgh Railways, uh, not only did they run the Cannonsburg cars up and down the line to uh, whatever location they could turn them at, here they ran cars uh, from the north part of Cannonsburg to um, Washington. Uh, so they did provide service where they could. Uh, one problem would result later when uh, uh, it looked like they wanted to abandon a line. Um, they originally had thoughts of serving Cannonsburg. They they got enough business out of Cannonsburg, but this was the north part of Cannonsburg, and there was no room at the south part to build. And they were in receivership and would have had to get court permission as well to spend the money. And they just didn't want to do it. They really didn't have that kind of cash. Uh, we'll cross the railroad. Still along Adams Avenue, there were two crossings. One was where the accident was at Spring Street North, and here um, is a 1600 coming south. Um, and um, Pike Street, it, the road kind of veers a little bit, becomes Pike Street. So we're off Adams, and we're on Pike, and we're still north of the downtown. We're, I think, at Belmont Avenue. Um, so we're giving you a view of what Cannesburg looked like. Uh, there was some double track in Cannesburg. There was single track um, as well in Cannesburg. And of course, 832 is down there because it's on its way to its new home uh, where the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum uh, now sits. Uh, here is 1711, um, which also um, resides now at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in active service. 
this is a 1952 shot uh, with South Boncourt. Uh, you can see a whole load of people getting hot too in 1952. That was quite a crowd. And another shot of uh, Cannesburg. Um, I don't know. I don't know Washington very well. So Bruce or somebody, if you know the intersection here, um, I would love to uh, put it on the show. So I would be very happy uh, for any help um, that you guys can give me. The Port Authority, I worked in their schedules department for years and years and years, but we didn't come down as far. So. Bruce says Central Avenue. Central Avenue. Well, thank you very much. I will make sure I put that in there. I appreciate that. And we're looking north. There's um, 3,700, 1948 or so. Probably right before, within a year, then the PCCs, the 1700s would be delivered. And that would, uh, that would mean the entire fleet of, of 37 and 3800s uh, would go to the junk pile. Um, that's probably the reason we just don't have one, that they went to the junk pile so fast, nobody you know, was able to even acquire one. We're at the south end of Cannonsburg now, back in the residential uh, sections. And a PCC is, is working its way north. Um, I'm sure I can drive down there someday and all of these buildings would still be there. Um, and I use this again, but I wanted to show you coming across. It's leaving Pike Street. You know, Pike's going to veer over to the right and uh, uh, we're, we're going get, to get to it in Houston. But the car line is going right through. Um, there's a radium dump um, down there. That, that, that I think, I don't know if it started in the Second World War, it was already existent. Uh, and I think it was existent because I, I read a story about yeah, it was a long time there. Marie Curry actually visited the radium plant that was located in that area. And she was actually given a vial of radium uh, to take back to Europe to um, be used in her experiments. In fact, I put that in here. Here's Alexander Siding, uh, located in that uh, area between Cannesburg and Houston. And it's 1952. And that bridge in the background is yet another crossing of Chartier's Creek. And there's the block signals here. I think they worked on track circuits. In fact, I think there was an accident on this line. There was so much sand at one part of the right of way that the, the, probably at a sighting, the car uh, didn't, didn't trip the signal. And there was a uh, head on, not in the PCC days though, somewhat earlier. Um, and down in the same area, um, Alexander sighting again, he's going the other way now, he's going north, he's inbound, uh, but it shows a different bit of background in the back, and uh, which is why I included it. Now, uh, this is, M, uh, I don't know, you can't tell, M55 something, um, we don't know, but Pittsburgh Railway's dump car was coming off of the line in Houston, and it will enter Pike Street, and uh, We'll run along for a few blocks. Here's our um, M1 making its way down Pike Street. It gives you a good view of Houston. And then we're going to turn off. Um, in this case, it's a northbound car. He's coming off the trestle um, and he is going to turn. Um, uh, what's the name of this? I can't think. Route 519. I know that, but I don't know the local name of it. Uh, to get to Pike Street, well, he will make a left. Um, the trestle looks like this. So you can see that curve um, that the interurban is coming off. Um, this was built uh, by the Washington and Cannesburg Street Railway. It's an existing trestle. And then we'll go up and over that trestle and you can see how it has to go up to clear the Pennsylvania Railroad in such a short space. And Grand Avenue was a dirt street. And uh, we're right on the side of the road, at least this portion. Um, and it will, there's our 832, um, kind of moved a little more to the center. Uh, we're in front of 312 Grand Avenue, according to who, whoever took this picture. Ara Mesrobian um, was a photographer in his own right back in the day. Now, this is a nice view. And I thought it would be great to, you know, I look at it and there's somebody on the left that frankly doesn't give a darn that there's a streetcar there. Somebody else is sitting there wondering, 
there hasn't been a car down here in six months. What the heck is going on? Um, as our three cars rolled down through Houston. But I remember a story that Art Ellis told me, uh, Lou Redman, who I was a very old member. I'm not sure if he was a founder or not, but a very long time member who did an awful lot uh, to get us the, I think, property down where we are today. He had run out of film in Cannesburg and he dashed into a store um, to grab film. He said, I got to go and get this film now. There's a trolley coming and to which the guy behind the counter oh, there has been a told him there hasn't been a trolley here in six months. And then our three cars just went by. He heard the bell and uh, Lou got his film very quickly, <laughs> got back on the car. Um, below that, um, you can still see where this is because there are concrete abutments there um, on the curve is Arnold Siding. There's a whole bunch of malls on the left now. That's Pike Street right on the edge of the picture. And this car is going northbound. And uh, there it is from this view. Um, and it's much more easily discernible now, particularly with the uh, vegetation um, out of the picture, you can still see some of that concrete. And beyond that, um, there's Arnold uh, siding. And then beyond that is just, we're running along Pike Street and we're gonna be heading to Allison uh, where many of us got off the interstate um, to start heading to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum for a good day's work. Uh, the poles are still set back. Uh, you notice poles set back because of the right of way. They're still set back on people's yards. So pretty, pretty amazing. But uh, uh, you can really discern where the right of way was. This is McGovern. Stop. And uh, there's another shot of McGovern because this is this, this. There were a number of bus, little bus lines running around um, Blue Ridge. I know went left Washington and went to places in West Virginia. And but that really shows you um, the right of way and the setback pole, uh, which is still there. The poles are still set back in many places along that road. Never widened it. Um, we're looking, this is another union switch and signal photo, and uh, we're looking north, and that is um, the bridge at Allison Hollow. And uh, you used to, for years, be able to tell where this was, and now they've realigned the road, and changed everything, and took out right away. Uh, but you used to be able, here's the here's a bridge um, with the southbound car. Um, and I think it used to be an IGA back uh, beyond it, but I think that probably has changed. Well, that's the old Allison Hollow Road. And another view of the trestle. Now we're looking towards Meadowlands, south part of Meadowlands. And we will go past several blocks in Meadowlands. And uh, uh, here is the church, still there. Um, the car made its turn here. The Meadowlands stop uh, was there. You can kind of follow the pole line. Uh, there and still see um, where it went. So the right of way isn't totally gone. Uh, it's just in places. Um, this is a closer shot of it. I believe that stonework is still there. Uh, and we are looking at a northbound car. You can follow the chain link fence too today. Yeah, yeah. That That's still pretty flat out there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this used to hang in a restaurant called Beachy's. Uh, which is no longer there in Meadowlands. And I believe Ray Chilcott took this photo. Um, and that was the first shot I ever saw at Meadowlands. And then we're going to head just a bit south. Uh, now, I wish I had my pointer working. So you're going to have to try to follow me. It's an overall view of Meadowlands. We're kind of looking north. Um, but go over to the last buildings on the top of that picture and look above that and follow the pole line. There is the trolley line heading through Meadowlands past or south of the stop. And it works when you, you have a pointer, much better. Um, but I'm going to get to Ridge Hill. There was a siding here uh, um, just north of Ridge Hill, the Meadowlands siding. Again, protected by the uh, block signals. They weren't very big sidings. You can fit about two cars in them. But this is Ridge Hill. so. When you're driving into the museum, uh, off to your right, up in there somewhere is Rich Hill. Um, I suspect some of the houses are there and uh, I haven't gone to look.
Uh, so we'll head down south a bit and we'll go out Priscilla Lane. And uh, all of a sudden, we're where the trolley museum is. Um, it's going to come out of Priscilla Lane and it's going to make this nice sweeping S turn. Um, and eventually we'll get on our right of way. And I say that because uh, some of it had to be moved a little bit off the right of way because of uh, uh, sewers that were there, utilities underground. Um, but this is right up there by the loop, McLean Farm School used to be there. And we are, well, anybody who's operated a trolley on a Pennsylvania trolley museum probably recognizes this view with the railroad um, off to the right. That would be the Pennsylvania at that point. But we are looking right up that right away. And here we are at the siding at County Home. And there's the commercial that Kristen used um, showing County Home um, rather unpainted. I don't have a date for this, pick this up at a train show and uh, lucky me. Um, the steps of course are still there. <clears throat> so we can all identify where that is. And today's car house would be uh, behind the car, behind the signal. Um, and uh, this is from the siding as well. And I grabbed this from the internet, um, I believe, or a similar copy was on the internet. Somebody has it in the archives. They, they printed it and it's a little blurry because uh, like so many photos you get, it's, you know, somebody prints a JPEG instead of the TIFF image. Uh, they pr print the, uh, um, you know, the, the compressed image. But uh, we're, we're here, that, that sighting, you know, held fare cars, southbound and northbound fare cars going to Cannonsburg and going to um, Washington. Now we're behind the car house. Our car house down there would be, Bridgeville car uh, area, would be right there to the right of the car. This is the bridge above it that is still there. Um, and Jim Schumann, uh, was lucky enough to be on the railroad when a car came up and got a northbound car. And that is in our archives. And then uh, somebody else shot across the creek from what is roughly now our trolley right of way. This is the original um, stop at Arden. Uh, and a railroad at one time, the Pennsylvania Railroad also had a station over um, in this area from pictures I've seen. And we're loading up at the county fair. And this is Art Ellis's picture. Um, he was down here. He wanted to get down, I think, and uh, on the 29th to get some shots of the Washington service. Um, it it supposed to be ending on the 29th. But, of course, the last car leaves Washington at 2.30. Um, at that point, the Tylerdale car barn is closed, and all the cars have to go back up to Pittsburgh to tunnel car house so so the last real trip really runs on august 30th 1953 and the next morning a few hours later uh, the cars will run only as far as drake now we're in that area between tylerdale and uh, um, the museum you know the car runs back a little bit off the road to get to the uh, uh, children's home and uh, it will cross over. I found the bridge abutments two days ago. Uh, it'll cross over Route 18 and it will pass through a trailer park um, to get over to Tylerville Car House. There are several, several bridges in that area, bigger ones and smaller ones. Nothing, of course, like Drake or Rich or Richfall Trestle, but more like this as they, they cross the creek, Chartier's Creek. Um, and we're not very far at all from. Uh, the car barn. In fact, here it is. We're looking south. Uh, the substation lasted a lot longer than the car barn, but it too is gone now. I walked in there and couldn't find anything. Um, and there's a lot of trespassing you have to do. So that part of the right of way uh, no longer exists. But we'll head just a little bit south. Um, there is the empty barn. And that tells me that you're really right at the end of service. Um, all the Washington cars disappeared. Uh, in earlier 1953, we're probably here in, uh, you know, somewhere in mid-June to that August date, the end of August. 
Um, but it gives you a good idea of what the car barn looked like. And we will swing off onto Jefferson Avenue. This is called Wolfdale, Wolfdale Stop. And one end of the Jefferson Maiden Line ended here. They had a little sighting uh, and the operator did his changeover, seats, poles, um, all that stuff with the controller that has to happen. And uh, they had nay shots on Jefferson Avenue because they had the interurbans coming and they also had the uh, pretty uh, extensive local service. Jefferson and Maiden was a fairly heavy line. And uh, there's the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge. There's a little bit of a grade there today. Um, so you can tell where it is. That's the Bronson, Brownson House. I got to say that right, Brownson House. And the buildings still say Brownson. It, it still says that on there. So we'll run up Jefferson Avenue. There were three sightings, three passing sightings on Jefferson Avenue. Um, today, much of Jefferson Avenue, I went down and I drove it. Much of Jefferson Avenue has really been uh, torn down. And so you can't really find um, these locations. Anybody know what siding this is? That's good, but you can't find any of these houses. The store buildings aren't there, uh, but the interurbans had to come in on Jefferson Avenue. Um, we were able to identify this. This is Wiley siding. And that was the middle siding of all three um, along Jefferson Avenue. But none of these buildings are, are here anymore. Even those houses in the background are gone. Now we'll turn on the Chestnut Street. Jefferson Avenue had a very different intersection than it is now. Um, it was an oblique intersection, but the Washington cars had to turn from Jefferson onto Chestnut. And so now for this little stretch, you've got the Washington cars, the East and West local cars, and the Jefferson made local cars all running in this area. This area was double tracked um, early on. And uh, it will get on to turn from Chestnut on the main street um, and then turn down to the depot, uh, which is just a short block, very short block um, on Bow Street just down from the uh, Washington County Courthouse. And you can see how this car is kind of tying everything up. Um, there we are. There's there's uh, the courthouse. Um, this is actually uh, Bow Street at Schaefer. The, you can see the switches. The interurban car would pull in there. Uh, East-West cars would continue on Bow Street uh, to the line, the city line. And there it is pulling in. There's a bank here today. I saw both citizens and a PNC, uh, but that's how you can identify that area. Uh, the car is going to pull in. That car on the left has already backed out and he usually had assistance. Somebody in the back was watching his pole and clearly watching the traffic, um, you know, which obviously is loads of fun in the post-war uh, years. Here it is sitting in there. And uh, whoever got that interurban sign, well, it's at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. It's one of our artifacts that we will be able to display someday, I hope. Um, and then the uh, area is getting ready to back out. That's a different view um, I thought I'd throw in of the terminal. And uh, the track went back a little bit. There was a waiting room. Uh, there were tickets being sold here uh, for the cars. And then it would back up. And now it's ready to go in. He obviously is starting to move because he's on the switch. And the east-west cars would head east, um, straight beyond. And the college cars, the North Washington cars, where that automobile is crossing, that's College Avenue. And they would loop through town and they would turn left to go back up Locust College Street, Locust Street. We'll see that in just a bit. And here's a color shot here. And uh, again, all the local service down there. And you don't know whether they're an East and West or a North Washington uh, car, uh, but they're there. And that church, I believe, was the United Methodist Church. Or, and uh, anyway, so we'll look a little bit now at the local lines. And I drew this and you can see the green line is the Jefferson Maiden Line. And then which comes down Jefferson Avenue and up Chestnut, down North Main Street and uh, uh, Jefferson. And that's the... Well, no, I'm sorry, east and west is green. So we'll go down on a west chestnut and through. And there it is, top um, at uh, the Eastboro line. Jefferson Maiden is the pink. 
and that's over from Wolfdale and all the way down Jefferson. It turned on the Chestnut, uh, turned left onto North Main. Then, of course, at the courthouse, it becomes South Main, down uh, East Maiden Street, all the way out to the line. And then the shortest line was one of the original lines, um, and they had rebuilt that. And it had originally gone out to Wilson Orchard. Well, now it went um, a little bit farther north also to the borough line. That was less than a mile long. That, that line was less than a mile long. Um, and we're looking from the George Washington Hotel. We're looking um, along uh, Main Street. That's a car turning on the bow. And for all I know, the other one will turn on the bow too. Or it could be a Jefferson and Maiden car and, and keep going. But uh, it was a really small system. When Fort Collins abandoned airlines, it became, I think, the smallest system, trolley system in a city in the United States, 7.56 miles. And this system always operated separately from Pittsburgh Railways. It had its own fear system, um, its own transfer system, and it had its own passes. And it had, I think, its own tokens um, as well. Um, Bruce, this is your map, and I want to thank you for it. You let me use it a long time ago. And it is a beautiful drawing, so much better than mine. And uh, Bob, this, since we're going to go over the lines, you know, I wanted people to see a much better version of that. So you can see east and west at both ends, uh, Jefferson and Maiden at both ends, um, and then that little line going up. Um, Wilson Avenue, of course, no longer there. It's red. Uh, there's the city line. And Washington Park, which we'll talk about, was part of the Jefferson Maiden line. Um, you know, it, it Pittsburgh Railways, as I said, brought its own equipment down. Um, these were not comfortable cars, of course. This is the um, East Maiden's part of the um, um, Jefferson Maiden line. And that uh, I like that uh, uh, poster because this was during World War II. And it said it was all right to throw mud at that. I don't know if people threw tomatoes or anything else, but mud was fine. And uh, they, that was their opinion of the Kaiser. Um, these yellow cars would come down in the mid twenties. I don't have a date. They were slow, the, low, the slow speed yellow cars and they would replace all of the old equipment in Washington, and they would continue to run out of the, the Tylerdale barn, uh, staying in Washington um, until the 1953 abandonments. It's an orange car, of course. The design initially was introduced in Pittsburgh in 1914. There were the 4200s, and these are the 43s. That doesn't mean they came down, though, that early, and I don't believe they did. Um, before they brought the yellow cars down, they had sent one or two down for test runs, uh, making all the turns, you know, finding out where the obstacles were, finding out what was too narrow. Uh, this report basically says, you know, that, that everything was okay. Um, they ran on the east and west line. You know, they have to lengthen certain stops, um, one definitely 20 feet, you know, um, mostly it were stop issues um, that had to be adjusted. So because these of course were longer cars. They weren't the, the four wheel cars that had been running. Uh, the cars that Washington and Cannonsburg originally bought and also cars, early cars that Pittsburgh Railways bought. Um, the lines were given numbers, which you never saw in the cars. That was in 1925, in August of 1925, they became included in the interurban division. And the W1 was the Jefferson and Maiden street line. 3.47 miles. W4, um, the east and west line, was 2.73. And as I said before, W5 became North Washington, 0.95 miles. And were, all these numbers were used internally, and nobody ever put a W this or that on a car. It was always east and west, Jefferson made, or North Washington. Uh, here we are on North Main at Bow Street, and uh, it's a Jefferson Main car. He's going to go through a uh, local bus that, that generally runs out in the hinterlands beyond the borders of Washington, uh, Washington PA. And uh, what John Baxter told me, um, only eight cars were actually required to operate the service on such short lines, certainly. Behind a yellow car, back by the pole, is a, a southbound PCC. He will turn 
onto Bow Street. The Jefferson Maiden car will run straight through here. Um, we're talking about nay shots, which I did get better dates on. Um, on the east-west line, um, they received nay shots on January 1st, 1923. Um, on the route car card, it was kind of hard to see for um, Washington, North Washington, but it appear, appeared to be early in 1923 from what I could see. Now, Jefferson Maiden got them on November 1st. 1923, but according to Ed Leibarger, um, they had always had some kind of <laughs> much older uh, signal system here, but that was a heavy line, uh, carried a lot of people. He said it was the heaviest line in Washington, and we're going to just follow that a little bit, and so follow that line from Jefferson and Maiden along Jefferson Avenue and two blocks up Chestnut Street, down on Main Street to Maiden Street through downtown. That's downtown in the middle where Bow Street is. And uh, there he is at the end doing his thing, doing his turn. Uh, not a wonderful station down there to stand in. I guess if the roof doesn't leak, it's pretty good. This is a better view looking up and inbound to Washington to downtown. There's the Brownson house and uh, where the railroad bridge was. And there is this, he has his own private siding. So he could sit here. He doesn't have to run to the car house uh, for any kind of relief. And we are running in Wiley, um, which I think was the first sighting there, or second. No, it's the second sight, sighting. And the church is still there. That church, I know, is still there. That was very easily identifiable. It's pretty close to the interstate today. Interstate 70 runs through here. There's a new school building there now, I believe. But that's still uh, the Washington High School. It's at Hallam Street. Um, and uh, you can see that in the background. The car is is running out to uh, Wolfdale. And we will get to West Chestnut Street. Now, this whole thing is knocked down today. Um, the road is straight. Um, in right-hand corners and all of these opulent buildings are gone. And uh, I love the sign on the pole um, telling you all the different places that you could go. And it is Route 31. Highway Route 31. So the mansard roof uh, building is gone. And uh, he's swinging around um, from West Chestnut onto Jefferson Avenue. He's a car heading over to Wolfdale. Stop. He's left downtown. And you see the tracks crossing, you know, pulling away to my right. That is the westbound east and west car line. Uh, now we're on uh, uh, West Chestnut Street. It's only about two blocks up that hill and uh, the gas station isn't there. That beautiful building was still there in 2017. Uh, it isn't there now. Everything's been changed, new apartments, new buildings. Um, this was 1949. Okay, now we're still on West Chestnut Street. We're about mid block between North Main um, and um, um, uh, Jefferson Avenue. This is Franklin. Franklin Street and much of this has disappeared too. But Franklin Street is still there and somebody had the presence of mind to uh, record that information. We'll go up to North uh, North Main Street. At this point, it's North Main Street. I was told at a show once Yorkins was a dress shop. Very nice group of senior citizens who shopped here, you know, were able to tell me something about this. And uh, um, he's turning, he's, he's coming outbound from North Main onto Chestnut and uh, one building on the right is gone and a part of the building in front, big white building is gone, but there's enough of it left to be able to tell what it is, okay? Now I'm at the courthouse. So South Main Street because uh, Bow Street is off to my left and that's where North and South Main change. Uh, the courthouse is right off to my right um, on the far side of the intersection. That big building, big buildings are still there, uh, quite identifiable. And a Jefferson Maiden car, he's coming up at Bow. He's coming the other way. You can see the tracks used by the Urbans, these West cars, and the North Washington cars turning off to the right. Okay, now I'm going to run down a bit. There's the dome for the uh, courthouse, which tells you where Bow Street is. And I'm going to turn onto East Maiden Street. Okay, I'm going onto the eastern part of my route. And of course, put this one in. I know it's a little dark, but the uh, color, you don't see many color yellow 
cars here. And I'll look back up the street and another car has just come out of Bow um, and he's starting to head up toward the courthouse. So we're heading up the street at the same location. Could just hear all the grinding motors of a low speed car here. Um, when you turn off East Maiden Street, you're right in that area, right there within that block. Um, and this is a nice color car from the Crambles Peterson archive. And uh, he's been very generous in sharing for our public programs. And I want to thank him. I don't think he's on. Um, we'll head down to the B&O Railroad, not very far at all from the uh, uh, intersection of Maine and Bow, or Maine and, uh, sorry, Maiden. But uh, this, is, this is an inbound car. He's passed under the railroad. So he's heading, he's heading to the courthouse. And uh, this is 1952. And if you want to see what it looks like on the other side, there it is. Um, and what really makes this photo nice um, is that big building. I don't think that big one's there I, I, or it's changed because there are other buildings in there. But that's part of Washington and Jefferson College. We're on both Route 19 here and Route 40. And then nobody that I found took pictures until you get to the end of the line. This is Dunn Avenue on East Maiden Street. And if car turned here, it would run up short distance into Washington Park. That track was put in pretty early. Um, I suspect this one's going to go straight. Not very far, a couple blocks. There's the end of the line. There's the end of the um, line at Washington, PA. And there is the Amico station, Johnson's Amico station uh, back then where you could pull under the roof. And that was the end of the line. Um, and you turned, you did the usual change and you were ready to go back in. Uh, so this is the borough line and Strabane Township beyond that. Now, if you went up into the park, um, right at the top of the hill is the end. There are two uh, pillars of stone and that was pretty much the end of track. And I remember when I first got here to Pittsburgh, a number of the operators on the trolley, I used, I had nothing to do. I'd ride the trolley at night um, just for fun. And a number of the operators uh, would talk to me. They were former inner urban operators. Uh, they had worked the Washington line, the Washington local lines, and they had stories to tell. And I'll never forget the one who told me they would have during the war. They had Saturday night dances and he would carry everybody would carry carloads of young women um, who were on a break, I guess, between working five or six days a week. And he said at the end of the night, the cars were going back nearly empty. And that could speak for itself. Um, and here is the end of the line. Ed Miller, I think, took this. So now that I know it's an Ed Miller shot, I didn't know where I found it at a show, but I identified it uh, from our negatives as an Ed Miller picture. So um, I will change that at some point. But there's the end of the line in Washington Park. He's just come through the pillars uh, that I mentioned, and uh, he'll sit and wait. Well, take a look at the east and west line. And, and uh, Bruce, again, thank you very much for the map. And you can see it down there. Caldwell Avenue and that little strip of right away we're looking down at the lower left and then all the way up Chestnut to Main Street um, it'll turn just a few blocks two or three blocks to Bow Street and then it'll pass the interurban terminal and it will head up to the city line uh, between Washington and East Washington and uh, we'll start at Caldwell Avenue down by the glass plant this is 1948 um, this part of it aligned the B&O Railroad would run on private right away. This this is the section of 2,600 foot right away, which was embroiled in three years of condemnation proceedings. And uh, we'll look the other way, so we can see glass plant railroad. And this was the end of his line. And I like this. It's color. There's a charter behind the regular car. And I know it looks similar, but I needed to put it in. And, and again, yellow cars in color um, are not that, they're available here and there, but not that easy to get. Most people in this era shot black and white, and then we'll run on this private right away. And uh, it, some of it is still there. I mean, I couldn't drive on it. I looked at it. It was a nice day on Sunday and I decided, yeah, the ticks are out and uh, I didn't want to uh, get that. We've got one pandemic already. Um, but it did parallel the railroad. There's the B&O, and then it'll make this turn to the left, and it will come down um, 
to uh, Chestnut Street. This guy is going to Caldwell Avenue and there's another shot of the right of way and he's coming from the end of the line. And like I said, some of it still appears to exist. Now we'll get onto Chestnut Street. There's Angelo's restaurant, um, which I remember eating in um, maybe in the late 90s or 2000. It's moved now. That building is still there. It's called uh, Patricia, or I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a pub now. I needed to change that bottom, bottom. And that's my fault. You know how you copy and paste and then, uh, uh, no, wait, that is Patricia. No, it's not a pub. That's something, if it's right, now that I remember it, it is Patricia Comets, I think. And there it is again. Angelo is there. The glass block is still there um, in a building and it, and it gives it away. And uh, there we are at Hart Street siding on West Chestnut Street. And Carroll Avenue is farther up. And uh, this is, again, 1952. Everybody knew the lines were going to close soon. And a lot of people were trying to get down there. Um, it's a signal section, of course, day shots. Um, and there we are on West Chestnut Street. And, you know, he's near Jefferson Avenue. I don't think he's approaching it. I really think he's going away because there's that big building on the back and that's an oblique street, which is what Jefferson Avenue was. So we're an outbound car and this is 1951. And notice they're advertising an event, anybody, anything to get you on the cars. Now here we are on West Chestnut Street and we are at Jefferson Avenue and uh, that gas station. So there's that fancy house in the back and the gas station. And we're heading up the hill and we're heading towards Main Street. And there we are on at Main Street, at North Main Street on West Chestnut Street. Um, the building behind the car, I had pictures with me on Sunday and the building behind the car is still there. The, the building over to my left is not there at all. But that, that other white building, uh, tells the story. So much in the back of this picture, the background is gone. And uh, there's Yorkins again, um, which is gone now. He's going to make his turn. Um, looking at him to my left, and uh, he is going to head over to Bow Street and turn off again. Again, that was a dress shop. And uh, there he is. There's the courthouse. So he is uh, North Main Street, and he's turning on the Bow as the interurbans would do. He's gonna go past the interurban terminal. Um, now this may be out of whack, I don't know, but it's, uh, yeah, it probably is. But I put it in, I will change that later. And I am sorry, but um, we are on North Main Street. We're gonna turn those are the switches to go onto uh, Chestnut Street. Uh, you can still eat an Isley's, but it's not an Isley's. It is the president's pub there, but it is still an eatery. I got to move these two slides around. Um, I'm looking down from Chestnut along North Main, and uh, there's a car coming outbound. It's either in East and West or Jefferson Maiden car. Um, a lot of these cameras did not give us the detail we would like. And the track over on the left uh, was a car from North Washington, uh, from Locust and, and College that will head down through downtown and also turn left on Bow Street past the interim terminal, in this case, to loop around, sorry. Um, and there we are again. So East Bow, North Main. And that uh, Western Union building, that's pretty much still there. You can identify it. Now I'll pass the interurban station. I'll pass Schaefer Avenue. I'm not going to go in the station, of course, but uh, cars tended to pass here. This was double track down to about College Avenue. And so you needed to pass. No other way to get past the car on this line. And uh, that, that church, I think, was a Methodist church. I believe now it may be part of Washington and Jefferson. Uh, anyway, we're going to head outbound. We're at College Avenue now. And the top of the hill uh, is Main Street, where North and South Main Street begin in their respective directions. 
Oh, the United First United Methodist Church. Okay, then I will correct that too. Uh, with this much information, it's always easy to make a, make a mistake. So if you catch something, please put it in the chat. I will fix it. Uh, we're heading out now. We're on a single track. We've passed College Avenue. We're heading up the hill. Uh, not very far, probably a mile to go to the borough line. They were short routes. And uh, we'll go up the hill again a bit. Now uh, I looked at and found some steps, which I believe are those. And they're between number 334 and 342. You know, ID like that is good for the generation coming, I think, behind me um, who may not have that experience of seeing what was there. They can only see what is there. Um, so IDing yourself is pretty, pretty important. This church is still there. I didn't know where it was. <clears throat> Found a photo. Um, went there. And there it is. <clears throat> North Lincoln is behind me. Um, I'm approaching South College, and uh, it's a beautiful neighborhood, very pleasant. Um, and then I will I will run up a half a mile, and I will actually cross into the borough of East Washington. That was East Washington High School uh, a long time ago, and uh, school building now is still there. It's still a school. It's the faith. Christian School and Institute, Lester. Wismer is a fantastic photographer, took that shot. And now, Bruce, we'll head up using your map uh, for the city line um, up there. It's near Washington Hospital. And uh, we will come down Locust Street, down College. Um, and uh, they actually, the railways rebuilt this line almost entirely, got in, getting rid of Wilson Avenue. And uh, there were some other streets they had to get rid of too that, that, that Highland, I think, may have been one, but uh, or a part of Highland. And uh, then they came in on Main Street and looped back on College. And there's not many shots to this um, because very few people did anything with this line. They didn't follow it up, they didn't walk up the hill. And uh, unfortunately, so, you know, we're passing the Interurban Depot. Um, he is looping around. And then he will go down another block or so. He will turn from East Bow on the college. Now he's going to go all the way up to the end of the line. And we got to the end of the line. And again, nobody shot pictures in the middle. Um, I guess most people would rather have been down in downtown anyway, where there was a lot of traffic. Think about it, three lines, uh, plus the interurban cars coming in and, uh, Perhaps most people actually rode the trolley down from Pittsburgh uh, rather than trying to drive to an unknown location. That's why I imagine that uh, the people didn't take much along the middle of the line. We're on Locust Street. We're right past, about a block past the original end of the line where the cars turned off on uh, Wilson Avenue. We're not very far from the Washington Hospital um, at this location. And then it will come back down. Here it is on East Chestnut Street. It's going to make its turn um, along that piece of track to go back into Towns. Um, Sears is now the Freedom Center. It's a place where I have different office, offices. It rents out space. And I was told that the big building there above the Citizens uh, was a movie at one time. In fact, there's the marquee. Um, I was told that at a show and later became a furniture store. So, and there's the movie. So now we're back at Chestnut and Maine and the car is ready to loop through town um, and then leave, okay? And the end. And I know some of you are probably very happy about that, but the end came in 53 and it was piecemeal. Um, on May 16th, uh, cars ran their final runs on East Washington, East and West rather, and North Washington. Um, and this is a uh, an East and West car and, uh, um, I was told it was at a post office. Ed just recently told me no. So that's another correction. Now, here's the end of the Jefferson Maiden. It waited June 20th, 1953. At that point, the car house was closed. The yellow cars were all brought up um, up to Pittsburgh. The interurbans began operating out of Tuttle car house, which means the bummers coming back to the car house had that long or 19 or 29 or so mile ride back up. And here we are at Bow Street, back up to the city. The interurban cars 
also began doing something because they closed the terminal. Uh, the ticket office wasn't there. The guy that helped back you out wasn't there anymore. And the cars just came out, Jefferson and up Chestnut, down Main, down Bow, and they went around the block. They went to college, you know, and back to Chestnut. And so they did that from uh, June 27th, 53 to August 30th. And I'll say 30th because of the the the, the last car being 2.30 in the morning, the official end was 29th. And that was the day the Charlotte Rail Line ended as well. The Interurban, however, stayed and operated until that day in August because the county fair people were concerned. How are we going to get the crowds to the fair? This is pretty sudden. And the railways agreed to keep service running until um, the fair was done. Um, they had put a, a Y here. This is the Drake Y. Eventually, the Drake Loop is going to curve down that track and, uh, you know, be under the Drake trestle. Um, that's a Washington car, but they had installed a Y so that they could turn the cars around when the service was over. And here's a photo. I know some of us have seen it. They would eventually put this loop in and the bridge would be torn down. And there's at least one bridge apartment uh, still there. That's Bethel Church, McLaughlin Run Road. Now, we'll just end this, you know, with maybe some good news here. But, you know, we know what's going on in Pittsburgh. <laughs> the company's in receivership. It continues to raise fares. Cutting the interurban lines back would save a bunch of money. Um, they weren't getting that much business from the outer end. Um, however, Castle Shannon, Bethel Park, starting to build up and an awful lot of short, short traffic short distance traffic was developing. So, and they had to fix big bridges and it just made sense. Um, there were competing bus operations that were causing trouble. And eventually we know the Port Authority um, would be formed to consume all these bus operations, the Pittsburgh Railways and the Monongahela, Monongahela Incline Plane um, Company. And uh, they gave it to the Port Authority because it was already in existence and it was developed formed to run, manage the inland port of Pittsburgh, which at that point was America's largest inland port. When the idea of another authority popped up, uh, the usual obstinance of Western Pennsylvanians showed up. They just did not want another public authority. And so um, they just decided to give it to the existing uh, authority. And that is why today it is still the Port Authority of Allegheny County running public transit. Um, that all came together on March 1st, 1964, and the Port Authority immediately started to close things. I mean, it got rid of the Knoxville Incline. Um, it wanted to close the Mon Incline. They would be stymied at that. Also, the Duquesne Incline, uh, those two are still with us. But by 1967, they had gotten rid of North Side streetcars, the East End cars, um, and uh, they had some lines in the South Hills. They had gotten rid of some of, some of those. Um, in late 71, um, as it would have it, the first time I came to Pittsburgh was early 72. So I missed uh, photographing the Carrick and the Knoxville and the Belt River lines. They were lines that run ran almost entirely on the street. So what did that leave us in the beginning of 1972? The Drake line, the library line, um, both of which were former interurbans, and the trolley line, which had private right away, also through Beachview, the Beachview neighborhood of Pittsburgh, and um, Mount Lebanon, and Dorma. And here is a, a shot showing the deferred maintenance out at Washington Junction. That, by the way, like the car before us, is 1724. Um, go to the Heinz History Center today. 1724 is a permanent resident um, there. But, but the line started to suffer uh, from maintenance issues. And uh, this was supposed to be Westinghouse's answer uh, to the trolley problem. The trolley had a lot of private right away. It had the 3,500 foot tunnel, um, which avoided all the traffic going through the Liberty Tunnel and the Fort Pitt Tunnel. Um, Westinghouse had this people mover. And I can best describe that today if you go to an airport, it's probably what you're gonna ride. It's on an elevated structure. Uh, it wasn't supposed to have an operator. And uh, people didn't like that. They wanted an operator in a car. Um, towns like Mount Lebanon just 
didn't want an elevated structure. And the stations were supposed to be a mile apart and uh, people didn't like that. So this fell by the wayside and now we had to figure out what to do. And there were numerous studies about what to do. Um, busway, I don't know. How did we get the, nobody at one point thought you could get buses to pass in the trolley tunnel. That was, that was a big concern. And uh, finally, you know, these systems during the energy crisis were being built in the West, uh, San Diego, Portland, some in Canada. And uh, Port Authority decided to take a hard look again at light rail. We, you know, it was a problem at that time. And they finally opted to rebuild a trolley, at least at that point, the line uh, through Beachview, Dormont, Mount Lebanon. They took three years to do that. But they finally rebuilt it completely with a, as a light rail line, and they they bought new cars, and they upgraded the Drake and Library lines for possible future rebuilding. And if anybody wants to know why it was called the T, um, because the marketing department uh, held a naming contest um, for these new cars, and uh, they didn't like some of the names, and they opted to uh, copy what they had in Paris and Montreal. And uh, I think in Boston, because, hey, nobody is going to know what's going on east of Altoona. Um, and then they, they decided we had to call this something new. Um, we don't want to have people calling this brand new, beautiful system a trolley. Although it is, in a way, very much upgraded, very well built. Here's the opening day. Uh, May 1987 was opening day, and they had a number of cars uh, for the political um, and business people and a PCC that they painted up uh, for um, Pittsburgh Railways, honor to Pittsburgh Railways. There was another car back in uh, another PCC all painted up um, for the uh, uh, what the light rail is now. And there's our car with a sign, proud to be a grandparent um, on loan. Um, we had a wonderful fan trip on that uh, the evening uh, of the opening day. They had to put a pantograph on it. So here is what we have now. And of course, they've rebuilt um, the other line. This happens to be an early picture I took in Beachview, but they have also rebuilt, I think it opened in 2002, um, the other light rail line that originally was the Washington um, Charleroi line. Um, now, it wasn't all a bad thing. I mean, I think a lot of people who are fans were very sad, and but it did provide one little bit of a silver lining because it we were able to acquire the property that is presently uh, the core of the trolley museum, the original right of way um, through that area. Here in February seventh, nineteen fifty four, are our three cars, two of the three anyway, moving south. That little white building by thirty seven fifty six was the original shelter and it was still there in the late seventies being used by uh, the property owner there as a shed. You know, you could always tell where it was. This is Drake Trestle. And uh, again, I use this, but hey, why not? Because, you know, you have to look at the old days. The old days we passed at, we passed these steps. The, in the old days, we actually stopped and served the county fair, you know. Um, this is no longer a weed grown right away. This is very well built, very well maintained right away uh, in the same spot. And we still run by the steps and we still serve the Washington County Fair, much as the streetcars in the older days did. Here's 66 passing that location. And uh, thank you for Arthur S. Ellis Jr. Uh, for this picture. This is 1711. We still have the PCCs running by the same signals that they operated by in the good old days. And they still take people to a destination, which is the TDB. And I hope very soon the visitor center. Um, so here is 1711, built for the Washington line. It is back home. And of course, these guys that we have seen so many pictures of, here's 3756 in the back. It was built for service on the Washington line, 4398. Oh yes, it's high speed, um, but very similar, in fact, almost identical to the cars um, that ran in Washington. And they are both down here, uh, able to give you a ride here. So I'd like to, and I'm sure the museum uh, personnel watching this would like to invite you all to come down to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum 
you know, enjoy the trolley ear, um, learn a lot. And uh, if you thought this show was too long, you can yell at me down there if you see me. But we are done, I believe. And uh, I'm going for a trolley ride. So but you can you can ask questions and you can make comments first. Uh, thank you for you know staying here this long and listening to me. It's been a lot of fun doing this. And uh, hope Kristen will have me again. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Um, we will get to questions in just a minute. Uh, George, why don't you take a second to scroll through the chat? You probably have like hundreds of notifications. Because <laughs> have a very active chat. Uh, so thank uh, you to those of you who will are you, kind will, of, you, will you be able to copy that for me later? Yes, I will send it to you. Um, oh, please, please. I will yeah, really yeah. enjoy. Uh, I will really enjoy looking at all this. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, so um, we'll get to questions and I'll let everybody unmute in just a moment here. Uh, you're welcome to turn your screens on or your videos on as well. But I did want to let everybody know that we are very close to the operating season here at the Trolley Museum. Uh, April 1st will be our first day and then the next couple weekends we'll have Bunny Trolley, our first event of the year. And April 20th will be our next Trolleyology, Philadelphia Commuter Rails uh, from Steve Barry. And then of interest to this group, we will have the Western Pennsylvania Trolley Meet again in person. Oops, I think I unshared my screen there. Um, again in person on June 3rd and 4th and anything on wheels June 4th and 5th. So we just put up some information on our website about the West Penn Trolley Meet. I hope you all can come, it'll be fun. First one again in person since 2018. So um, we had a lot of awesome questions pop up in the chat during the presentation, which I'm gonna to try to get to, but if you would like to kind of unmute yourself and ask those in advance, uh, you can do that too. So I just said it so that everyone can unmute themselves if they'd like, um, but thank you again, George. That was awesome. I learned a lot. Um, I'm not from the Pittsburgh area, so I've been kind of dying to see a show like this so I can learn a lot more about, um, you know, how the trolleys got to Washington and and uh, what was going on around where the museum is. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, at this point, feel free to unmute your microphones and ask a question. We're getting lots of nice- uh... Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes. um, I, wanna, I wanna try to get out of here first so that I can see all you guys. Um, there we go, yeah, there we go, right. yeah. Can I ask a question? I'm Gary. Uh, how long was the ride from Pittsburgh to Washington? About 29 miles. How long? I mean, how much time travel? Oh, without looking at a schedule, but I'd say at least an hour. <laughs> oh, it was more than that. More than that? Okay. Uh, I, don't I have think a, so, George. Oh, I, never, I was never that. able to purchase a schedule um, at any of the shows. Um, but um, if you were here, you know, you, you would know this. So thank you. It was more than an hour then. Uh, let us know. Yeah, I do believe. Enjoyed it, George. Really good. Hey, thanks, Ray. How you doing? Good. good really yeah, that was very nicely done. Thank you for that, George. Thank you. Thank you. George, very nicely, George, very nicely done. And uh, good show, good comprehensive uh, travel over the lines. And thank you for the presentation. And Christian, thank you for organizing the presentations. I know what it takes to do something like this. <laughs> and thank you, Paul, for uh, letting us use more than 100 people or have more than 100. Yeah, yeah that was that. really good. That was good. Yeah, was we had, good. I think, like yeah. 140 register uh, the wow. last I checked. So some people actually registered after the program started. So uh, welcome <laughs> if, if you missed the beginning. <laughs> well, you, you'll be able to post this on your YouTube. There's nothing here that... Uh, um, is a secret. And uh, so others can watch it or rewatch it. Um, I have a question here. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but uh, uh, somebody wanted the picture of the arch windowed car, which I'm assuming is the new uh, 3600 car put up again. In other words, put my, my show back up and maybe oh, we yeah, can do that can after do some of the questions. I don't mind doing it. I mean, we'll get some other questions in case people have to leave and we can do that. We could bring that up again. Excuse me. I thought the uh, George. I thought the the uh, Washington uh, Kensworth <laughs> two hundred series cars were pretty sharp. They were nice looking cars. They, they were, were nice, nice looking cars, and I believe they were 
they were being used for a while with the 3500s and they did make it up to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, one would later become a freight car. And it was several, out, several, several it. George, several, several. Yeah, the, 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 I know there was F eight and F nine. Okay, those were the two that lasted into the end of the fifties as snow plows. And uh, comment. Oh, sorry, Bruce. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the 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 one photo that um, is worth commenting on. There was a picture of one of those cars with a family sitting on the end of the car uh, at a crossing. WC car, right? Yeah, up there. the yeah. WC car, 203, I think. Uh, that photo was given to the museum by a lady that lived on McLean Farm Road named Dilly. And um, that was her father was the, or her grandfather was the motorman, or her father was the motorman. And that was a family photo that she brought down many years ago and gave yeah. to the museum. That was a glass plate. According to Ed Leibarger, there were a number of glass plates. Oh, yeah. From the Washington. Yeah, well, yeah. That wasn't the only one. Um, well, so that one from Dilly was just a family photo. Yeah. It was not a glass plate. Okay. Glass plates. Uh, a, a gentleman was cleaning out his attic in a house he bought in Avella, which is nowhere near the museum or is nowhere near the trolley. Line. And he found the glass plates in a box in this in this building and saw that they were trolleys and he brought them down one day or, or he called Scott and said, I have a bunch of glass pictures of trolley cars. <laughs> and Scott, oh, bring them down. So the, the guy brought them down and, and that's what they were. They were the construction photos for the Washington Cannonsburg. And that's where the 202 at the corner of Maiden and uh, at, uh, Bo and uh, by the Main office street and uh, at the corner in Houston uh, with the um, WNC cars uh, broadside views. That's that's where those came from. Those and and a bunch of the single truck cars that you showed too. Um, one thing I did want to quickly mention before we got to uh, other questions. Oh yeah. Um, if you're uh, interested in Pittsburgh books. street cars. We have a new book published by the museum, uh, Pittsburgh Streetcar City. So mm -hmm. it is available on our website. Um, what is it called? I think it's the shop tab on there and you can order it uh, through a form online. And when we open for the season, we'll have it in the store. And of course we will have this at the West Penn Trolley Meet as well. So uh, just had to put that plug in there really quick. I thought the, uh, I thought the windows on the 200 series cars, this picture windows really set them off. Yeah, well, those those cars were described. There, there, there was a scrapbook uh, that was kept by the um, president of the company that sold in 1906 to Pittsburgh Railways, and it was in the W and J Library, and it had a, a um, newspaper clipping describing how opulent the interiors were. There were uh, beveled glass mirrors, I think, on the interior of the car between, you know, in the wide posts. Among other things, the plush seats and, and what yeah. is that hey, those um, cars? For the for the person, if I can interrupt, please. Um, for the person that wanted to know about uh, uh, running time, uh, George Chiason was here, and I guess he's got info from Dave Hamley, uh, museum member. Said it was about ninety nine minutes. Yeah, yeah, I figured it was yeah. about an hour and a half. Is yeah, what I thought. So, so we we can answer that. Pretty very close. good. Yeah, my 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 1943 schedule is about an hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> if you can see that, I don't I don't know if you can or not. I I uh, put a question in: Were the interurbans four motor cars? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So they were fast. Well, they were fast. Yeah. Uh, now I see from the interurban cars, and you know the guys are really hooking along with a PCC, and the track isn't that good in the end, and they're really bouncing along, but. Uh, yeah. But the original 36, 7, 8s, they were all four motor cars, yeah. George and Bruce, you mentioned that there were beveled mirrors in one of the cars. What was it those arch window inner urbans? No, it was the um it was the original Robertson, the the design. Oh, yeah, the Robertson cars, car, right? Robertson design right. by Pitts of uh, the St. Louis Car Company. One one yeah. more question. Did the PCCs have uh Interurban uh, B3 trucks. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Right. Your, in your first picture there, you showed uh, 1,600 in urban. You said they had special B2s. They were called B2, I think, yeah, that, uh, yeah. you know, they B3s were developed and, and put under the cars. Um, that, the there were several yeah. experimental trucks that were made. And uh, St. Louis Car Company built the B3 trucks, as well as the B2B trucks that were under the 1700s. The, yeah. Well, I definitely know the 1700s would have B3s. Yeah, well, the, the 1600s, uh, when I remember them, they had them, although they'd taken them off of 1613 when I was a kid. And um, and the roof headlights didn't come along right away either. If you were watching, you know, the 16, and there were 1645 and 1644. And um, uh, I forget what other cars, but those are the two that stick out of my mind. They didn't have roof headlights and eventually 1644 went back into city car service. I have a question about what I call the pre-PCC interurbans. There were two, one has the arch roof and the other one had the clerestory roof. Yeah. Were, was one used on one interurban line and the other and one on the other, or did they mix them up? They mixed they, them up. Uh, yeah, they, they mixed them up, but, but, just from my observation of photos, the 3700 seemed to be a Washington car more often than not, and the 3800s were a Charlery car. And 38's the one with the arch roof. Yeah, and those yeah. were St. Yeah. Louis Car Company 1928. Yes. The yeah. um, 37s were Brill 1917. Um, I've, I, I don't know it to be true, but you know, if, if the Washington line started with uh, the the Robert, the St. Louis car company built cars, the, uh, the 3600s came along to, to make, to have a real interurban cars for the Charlery line because cars like the museum's 3047 were the cars that originally opened the Charlery line. So in 1909, they bought cars to, to definitely get a, fancy and urban car for Charlotte. And then when the 37s came, they became the new cars for the Washington line. When the 3800s came, they became the new cars to replace the cars on the Charlotte. And I, that isn't cast in stone, but, um, you know, I think if, you know, my observation of photos has been that over the years, but they did mix and match them. They did run them. Yeah. In, in and I think places. I made a mention of that, that I'd seen more uh, predominantly 37s on Washington and yeah. 38. But but yeah. again, we saw today how they did, you know, it was whatever worked, I think they sent it yeah. up. Yeah, whatever went out of the barn went out. Or whatever but, you know, there the might have been clearance else. problems in the car barn at Tyler did, you know, uh, for a wider car. I think the 3800s were a little wider. Wasn't there a, an attempt at a second uh, 3700 group that didn't ride well, so they put them into city service? Well, that's the one George mentioned that in his talk. That was yeah. the 30s and 50s. The ones that look like yellow cars. And yeah, they did not they're just ride a yellow car. Them. And I think they were only out about two and a half or three years um, before they, they started assigning at least some to Sewickley. Sewickley was a very long line that went north. Um, and they cut doors on, on the left side because uh, on one side, you have to let people off on the riverbank, literally near the river. Well, on the highway. And the museum uh, has one of those it, it higher parallel between the river and the road. Um, but some of them stayed, I think, in tunnel and they were used on the Shannon line. Well, there were Shannon line. There were eight cars that were or nine cars that were converted for Sewickley. And that was done during <laughs> at the beginning of World War II, was my understanding. Well, that was done because they didn't want to leave, leave passengers out in the car traffic, right? Yeah. On, yeah. On, yeah. Grand Avenue or Neville Road yeah, it or was a, Grand Avenue Road. ran right alongside the private right of way, yeah. and uh, there, you couldn't let. Yeah, it was a very busy road. Yeah, particularly during the war. Yeah, we and got one a of question. those cars is at the museum. Yes. Yeah. We got a question in the chat from Philip Sauerlander. Uh, he says, "Very good program." Did the interurban lines have separate operating rules than the city lines? They had their own. There were all the rules about signals and and uh, and things were definitely uh, separate. Although I, I don't know that everything wasn't in one rule book. 
I mean, I've only seen one rule book. Yeah, I've never seen a, an interurban only uh, yeah. rule book either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the signals definitely were something that the uh, interurban people needed to know, and city operators really didn't need them except about nay shots. Oh, for nay shots. Yeah, yeah for nay shots. Yeah. Any other questions for George? I know I missed them. I'm really sorry I missed them during <laughs> during the presentation. Sorry, go ahead. I had a, a quick question. The, the sidings, <clears throat> were they all spring switches? Yeah. 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 Just like the museum, everything was set up that same way. Yeah. And, and on the line, the portion of the line over to Oak Trestle along 51, uh, they had double wire. So they wouldn't have to have frogs. I mean, that shows up in the pictures, at least back then. Yeah. Now, under Port Authority, they had, my recollection was single wire with frogs. Not a not not initially or for many years that I remember. I, I thought they always had a double wire until they tore it up. I think oh, that's yeah, I think that's probably I mean, our guys tore that stuff up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would know. I have, I have a uh, memory from my childhood of the Drake Trestle. I lived at the eastern end of Drake Road, and the Trestle was at the western end, if I remember correctly. And I think there was maybe a mile, mile and a half distance from, but I can recall walking along South Park Road from my house down toward the Rutherford Shopping Center and hearing the cars go across the Drake Trestle. <laughs> they were quite loud, and that, yeah. you know, that that sound traveled for quite a while. Yeah, yeah and I think um, actually quite a few <laughs> folks um, commented on childhood memories and, and things, uh, childhood stomping grounds during this program. So uh, you're not the only one, John. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else before we wrap up here tonight? I uh, I just looked on the Freedom Transit website and they do an hour and 25 minutes. So there you go. From from Pittsburgh? Zooming from along. <laughs> yeah, he's got a heavy foot. Oh, you know what, though? Do they, do they just run between South Hills Village Station and Washington? No, that's from the uh, commuter run <laughs> where they started the Amtrak station. Uh, all right. Just they, come down down they come down 79, I mean. <laughs> yeah, they might do that. Yeah, yeah. They got these 30-foot buses hey, going on 39. It must be like riding a Bernie car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my, my mother was a dispatcher for them. It's slightly faster, but they the service is not like the interurbans. I think they have like, what, five runs in the morning and five runs in the evening. So, yeah, you know. Well, they only have like five buses. Yeah, it's got a big inner ride. city buses, or actually, they're all transit buses. Yeah, they're transit buses. They're really not inner city buses. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just thirty. They're, what thirty five feet? The route. Some of them are thirty. Some of them are thirty five. Yeah, I've seen the little thirty footers going down seventy nine. That has to be it. They built a transit center in Washington D.C. So they're 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 ahead of Pittsburgh. There, they've got their own terminal. Bruce, you should lobby for them to put a uh, interurban headlight on the top of the bus, right? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. I have to. I, have to, I, I don't know who to talk to, but I know where the garage is. You know. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, hey, Kristen, before you say goodbye, um, if you can send me uh, the uh, list of chats, I'd love to look at them. Sure, I will do that. Yep. Thanks hey, for reminding. Thank you so me. much. Thank you. And thank Enjoyed you, it, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for joining us. And especially thanks to those of you who donated. I think we raised over $240 for tonight's free program. Oh, wow. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. And we will see you guys again. Stay tuned to our website, patrolley.org, for all the upcoming uh, trolleyology announcements and announcements about other events, our new book, and our operating season. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And yes, have a good night.